good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Chris Zarbach, who um, I met and when we were both trainees in Wisconsin, where he did his medical school training, um, and uh, and I did residency, and then he is completing a CP um, residency with with us, and um, will be graduating this July, and th then after that he will be. Um, he will be doing a uh, mole combined molecular genetic pathology and clinical informatics fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. And so it's been uh, wonderful to work with you, Chris. He's he's rotated uh, with on informatics several months and has helped immensely with uh, a number of projects. So um, excited to hear your your talk today and um, and see follow your bright career in the future. So thanks. Thank you for that. Very kind introduction. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you um, coming out and and uh, listening to my talk. Um, you know, this is something that um, is uh, gaining significant traction in uh, both the general sector and uh, in in the world of pathology. And I thought uh, it was a very timely topic. Um, what with chat GPT and um, all of the excitement around that. Um, and with a lot of the things that we're seeing um, in in both uh, the AP and uh, CP world. So um, wanted to to briefly talk about that for for all of us today. So to begin uh, disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Um, uh, with regard to my uh, learning objectives, uh, I have three. And there are um, uh, a few that I'll spend uh, quite a bit of time going over. So, um, you know, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning um, in general can be uh, somewhat daunting and, and somewhat uh, uh, mystic. Uh, and, you know, I will um, go uh, through uh, the basic tenets underlying machine learning. And I, I intend to do that so that it helps to demystify this uh, topic and uh, so that we can gain a, a, a fundamental understanding of um, how machine learning uh, works. Um, I'll throughout the talk um, be uh, discussing a number of different applications uh, of machine learning within pathology. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to take away from this, you know, a couple of the different applications that are available. Um, and, uh, this is, uh, this final learning objective is, is, uh, also quite important. You know, there's a lot of benefits. Um, machine learning has a number of capabilities, um, but, um, just like anything, uh, there are a number of limitations. And so I think that that's, that's quite important to know, uh, as well. So um, the impetus for uh, my talk today um, came out of uh, an article that uh, Dr. Stoffel uh, introduced to me during one of the uh, one of my informatics rotations, and um, I, I felt like this was a really uh, insightful and um, uh, comprehensive overview um, from the lens of pathology and and um, and wanted to give credit where credit is due early on. Um, a lot of the ideas I draw are from this paper. So, um, you know, the first question you might ask is, you know, why is it important? Why should we even be talking about this? Um, and uh, I think it is coming, you know, it, it, is, it is already on the rise in our uh, daily lives. Um, the predictive uh, text that uh, we see in um, our Google searches or perhaps emails um, to to even when we watch uh, Netflix, uh, you know, it's it's pervading our lives already. And and that is the case um, that will be the case, I think, with many, many different sectors, <clears throat> medicine and, and pathology uh, included. Um, I think um, with any tool, it's very important to know about you know, the scope of applications um, and then the strengths, which of which there are many, but also the, the limitations of machine learning, because 
at the end of the day, uh, we will be uh, the, the kind of the gatekeepers for um, the application of these tools within pathology. And, uh, you know, it might be the case that someone shows you this uh, um, machine learning algorithm with all these bells and whistles and says, you know, you're going to love this. It will totally revolutionize uh, what you're going to do. But it's important to be able to critically uh, analyze and um, understand how to, to verify those tools and then monitor uh, them and above all else, determine, uh, you know, if they're even clinically appropriate. So um, as we look at the kind of just broad overview, um, beginning with artificial intelligence, um, there is a sense of general AI and uh, this is um, captivated or this is captured by um, artificial intelligence that would be able to um, actually learn uh, in addition to whatever skill you taught it. So say, for example, you uh, teach an artificial intelligence algorithm to um, identify mitoses, um, and then it could go and, and, and figure out how to, um, you know, perhaps also classify tumors. Um, in a in a more broad sense, this is kind of like the machines taking over. Uh, they would be uh, able to to learn any sort of thing that humans would be able to learn, uh, very similar to as a human child does. Um, but this doesn't exist yet, um, and so we are uh, very much in the the realm of narrow AI. And um, narrow AI can be thought of in um, two different realms. And the first is uh, expert systems, uh, and then to contrast that we have machine learning. And so with expert systems, these are um, systems that are created um, by, as the name implies, experts, or at least the rules are uh, encoded or dictated by the experts in the field. So this might be um, uh, an example uh, used is a differential diagnosis generator. Uh, you give inputs um, like the, uh, vitals and the symptoms and sign uh, of a patient, and it might spit out, you know, this is what uh, the the top um, most likely thing is, and and here are the things that are less likely. But any rules that you want the software to um, utilize, you have to hard encode. Whereas uh, machine learning is is wonderful because um, this is not dependent on human. Um, uh, human knowledge. It, it can, um, can learn uh, based on um, using an algorithm and a comprehensive data set, um, and then it can identify those patterns. So uh, just to, to illustrate that, I bring up a, a problem that I've had, uh, my wife and I have had many a Friday night or Saturday night, and that is, you know, what movie to watch. We all have many, many different streaming services now. And so, um, you know, you could imagine a, a piece of software um, that could help you decide this. And so uh, with, with an expert system, um, on the one hand, uh, within narrow AI, you might say, well, I, you know, really want to watch an action film. And please make sure that this action film uh, has Harrison Ford in it. Uh, and I want the, the, uh, IMDb score, that's uh, the Internet Movie Database score, to be greater than eight. And I want it to be uh, Rotten Tomatoes certified fresh. So these are, you know, markers of a good movie. And um, you put in those, those inputs, uh, hard encoded, and the expert system uh, might uh, kick out for you, well, you should watch Star Wars. Uh, you know, this, this meets all those criteria. And uh, it's a great, great movie. Um, and, you know, it might also say, well, let's watch, uh, you should watch Indiana Jones and this is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, but it could be any of the Indiana Jones movies. And where uh, machine learning uh, really shines is um, there's a, a finite set of films that, that meet these criteria. But say you are, um, you know, on your Netflix account and uh, you've watched uh, over time, all, uh, all of these movies that meet these criteria and you're trying to find something new, what machine learning can do is it can take things that are not 
necessarily um, in that same realm. So, you know, this, this uh, film does not meet the, uh, the, the category of needing Harrison Ford, and it's not quite IMDb more than eight, but um, what Netflix can do is take those inputs, um, that is what you've watched and how long you've watched uh, particular things, and um, figure out, kind of predict what, what you uh, would like. And so it comes up with this recommendation, and you're like, oh, that's, that's great. Um, and we can see this, you know, if you, if I look at my Netflix account versus my wife's Netflix account, very different suggestions are given. And so the, the next uh, logical question is, well, how, how do machines learn? And so I'll, I will um, explain that kind of in, in prose here and then uh, go into a conceptual example to help um, make it a little bit easier to digest. So really at the end of the day, um, you know, all of this, this magic that seems to be happening kind of under the hood um, is really a modification and, and really an optimization of output in response to input data. And so in order to learn uh, machines or these, these algorithms require instances or samples, and these have to have a shared set of associated features or attributes. And so then the algorithm is able to take patterns uh, in those features and associate them with a particular uh, instance label or class. Um, and this, these three uh, uh, steps are really, really how, you know, machines learn. Um, but in order to make this conceptually a little bit uh, easier to understand, um, I found this book very helpful. And you'll notice that on the, the cover, there are watermelons. And uh, that's because the author um, uses many different examples uh, uh, of discriminating uh, between a good and a bad watermelon in, in his attempt to explain uh, machine learning principles. So let's pick a watermelon. And um, in, in the book, the author talks about uh, many different ways to predict this. And he starts with these three attributes, uh, color, the root, and this was translated from Chinese. So this is actually a tendril. Uh, and then the sound based on uh, thumping the, the watermelon, um, what, what actually uh, you would hear. And so based on these three things, um, the, you're able to uh, kind of predict, you know, th is this watermelon ripe? Is it ready for eating? Similar to how you might go to the, the supermarket and, and look at, you know, say bananas and, you know, you don't know a priori that they're ripe or not, but you've learned that you know the ones that are green are generally less ripe and the ones that are yellow are generally more ripe. But in terms of uh, the watermelon itself, um, you can imagine we have kind of four different watermelons here and we know the, the kind of the outcome. But just for uh, a brief moment, I'll go over some terminology. Each of these columns here are uh, known as attributes or features. So the color, the, the root or the tendril, and then uh, the sound that it makes when you, when you thump it. And um, the individual values that each of these attributes can take are known as attribute values uh, or feature values. When we look at uh, a particular row, um, this excluding the label uh, is an instance or a sample. And uh, if you think of uh, color, root, and sound as uh, three different axes in, in space, uh, then this uh, becomes a vector. And you can have you know, a large number of attributes, so you can have n-dimensional space, but it is still a vector. Harder to visualize for humans above about three dimensions. And then this final uh, column here uh, of whether it's ripe or not is, is called the label. And this is, this is critically important uh, in what uh, is called supervised machine learning. And that's because uh, the algorithm needs to um, be able to associate these attribute values with a particular outcome in order to, um, in order to, to make better predictions and arrive at the correct prediction. Together, uh, all of this is called a data set. And this is what we use to train uh, the machine learning algorithm. 
So uh, the first step uh, is training or teaching the uh, machine learning algorithm. And so we have these training data, uh, as I mentioned, and um, there are inputs to our algorithm. Uh, and W, X, and Y here are the uh, particular attributes, and we feed those to uh, a particular algorithm. And you'll notice that there's uh, A, capital A, capital B, and capital C. And these are known as weights. And this is uh, the, the item that is actually varied uh, over time uh, in order to get closer and closer to the actual prediction of, in this case, ripeness. So we take a particular set of inputs and we um, use their weights. And this gives us uh, an output. That's really the, the answer of the algorithm. And we compare that to the label. And uh, when we are able to do that, we um, look and see, say, you know, how close is this, uh, this output to the actual label? And we use what's called a loss function. And you know, if it's if it's really close, uh, we're not going to make uh, much adjustment in uh, these weights, these A, B, and C. But if it's if it's really far away, we might modify uh, A, B, and C quite a bit um, because we we want to iteratively go through this. And uh, each time we feed another uh, instance, we want to be able to get closer and closer to the the actual correct answer. And so iteratively going through this we're able to modify uh, A, B, and C um, until we get really, really, really close to the correct answer every single time. And so this, this slide is uh, a very, uh, I'm, I'm much more of a visual learner. So this is a very uh, good um, way of understanding you know, how machines are learning. It's really an iterative fashion, kind of like you know, a human might do is in, in terms of, well, let's try it this way, let's try it that way. And the closer and closer you get to doing it right, um, the better and better uh, you are at learning something. So now that uh, we have uh, an algorithm that we've trained, um, we can go to uh, deployment state. And this is really the value uh, of these machine learning algorithms or any model in general. And so now uh, we have the same algorithm, but we've optimized uh, A, B, and C, and we take novel inputs. So uh, for example, uh, the color of light, root that's curly and a sound that's muffled. And uh, we don't know what the output is and we're trying to predict it. You know, it could be if it's continuous variable, it could be uh, how likely the watermelon is to be ripe or it, if we have a discrete cutoff, it could be whether it's predicted to be ripe or not. And so uh, we take these optimized A, B and C values and we get an output and um, you know, it's unknown what this, what this is, but we can see in this small data set, at least, that there have been many different uh, instances of. Um, I, know in, I didn't know if you went. Oh, oh. Is someone there? I think someone. Yeah. You could mute yourself. Um, so we, if we look at these uh, two different uh, instances or samples here, um, we see that uh, the changing the color doesn't really matter. And so we would very much predict this to be uh, ripe. And so at the end of the day, that's great because we get to enjoy some good watermelon. But you know, this is obviously a contrived example um, and uh, machine learning algorithms are capable of much, much more than this, but just, just for a conceptual understanding. So uh, looking at the overview uh, of machine learning in general, um, as I kind of alluded to before, uh, there are both supervised and unsupervised um, uh, algorithms. And this is, this is really the general breakdown that we think of. Um, with regard to supervised algorithms, uh, within our data set, um, we have uh, labeled uh, uh, instances. And um, this is something that the domain expert would know, um, you know, in, in pathology, whether uh, it, it truly is a, a particular uh, Gleason grade, for example. Um, but this is something that you you give to the algorithm ahead of time so that it's able to associate a set of uh, inputs with that particular output. 
And so uh, an example of, of supervised machine learning uh, could use uh, regression method algorithms. And uh, one algorithm that uh, you know, we're familiar with is linear regression. And this is very simple, taking a, you know, one input and associating it with uh, a particular output. And you can, you can do this in n-dimensional space. And then uh, it's called uh, um, uh, multiple uh, uh, multivariate regression. And um, let's see, uh, advancing. And so um, as an example of this, uh, Dr. Klein, actually, I was pleasantly surprised to find, uh, was um, the first author on this paper that um, used uh, a number of different, uh, uh, more easily accessible factors to predict the Oncotype DX score. So um, they created in this paper new, ver new versions of the McGee equation um, using uh, multiple uh, linear regression. Uh, based on you know relatively low cost pathology data, so the Nottingham score, P67 index, tumor size, um, the H scores for estrogen and progesterone receptors, and uh, human epidermal growth factor receptor, and they were able to take those and predict uh, the Oncotype DX score, uh, which is uh, a more costly uh, genomic analysis for determining the likely benefit of chemotherapy and risk of recurrence in breast cancer. So that's you know a practical example that we can see in pathology. Under supervised uh, machine learning models, we also have uh, classification methods, and so the difference uh, that we're seeing between regression methods and classification methods is that if the desired output is um, a continuous variable, uh, we use uh, regression methods, and if we're trying to um, have uh, particular uh, labels, uh, say ripe or unripe or a particular uh, grade of um, uh, neoplasia, then we can think of using classification methods. And so a commonly used algorithm here uh, is something called a support vector machine. And uh, what a support vector machine does is kind of similar to what we were seeing uh, in you know, fitting a curve. This fits uh, a hyperplane. And um, we want uh, the... the um, uh, distance between uh, the hyperplane and these classes, uh, the boundary margin to be maximized. And so example of this uh, in the, the uh, realm of pathology is um, seen in this paper here, uh, where they were able to take um, quality review of uh, uh, mass spec data uh, and um, automate that uh, for um, use of, of verifying patient uh, samples. And, uh, you know, in, in, in the uh, mass uh, spec uh, lab, um, it is often time consuming endeavor to uh, conduct the quality review. And um, by using support vector machines, they're able to automate this and um, increase their throughput. So uh, this brings us to unsupervised machine learning. And uh, the key difference in unsupervised machine learning versus supervised machine learning is that there are no labels. And so we have these uh, various attributes uh, and their values, but uh, you know, there's, it's, it's unknown whether it's you know, ripe or not, or what particular um, you know, Gleason grade it might be, for example. And so um, the idea here is that we're um, clustering um, things into particular groups and it can help to reveal previously um, unknown uh, examples uh, in, the, in our data set. And so one of the common clustering uh, algorithms that is used is called k-means clustering. And the, um, the objective here is uh, we can see uh, with these arrows a cluster centroid, and um, we want to minimize the within cluster distance. For example, here are all these uh, white circles and we want to maximize uh, the between cluster distance. And so by doing this, we're able to define discrete groups. Um, and uh, there was a, a nice uh, paper uh, that they mentioned um, that is able to actually um, measure the relative increase in the number of nuclei uh, in these uh, whole slide images um, of uh, normal squamous cervical epithelium, or excuse me, normal cervical squamous epithelium versus uh, different grades of uh, CIN. 
And so this was all a part of uh, an algorithm for uh, CIN, that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia classification. And so this, these are just a few different examples of um, machine learning algorithms that have already been applied uh, in the world of pathology. So I wanna spend uh, a little bit more time um, discussing neural networks. And this is, this is where a lot of the, um, the hype, so to speak, has been coming from because uh, neural networks are a very, very powerful tool uh, in uh, image classification, in, in automated image analysis. And so I think they deserve uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit more time for us to, to understand how they're working. So we start out here with a, a simple neural network. And um, as the name implies, it has some similarity uh, to the, the system of the interconnectedness of neurons in, in, in the brain in biology. And um, the idea here is that there are a number of different inputs um, received uh, for a particular node, and each of these circles represent nodes, or you can think of almost like a neuron, receiving different inputs. And then it is, there's actually what's called a transfer function, which has a threshold. And uh, instead of being a step function, it's usually a sigmoidal function. And this is to determine what the output is. And so by processing uh, data in this way, uh, there, the um, neural network is able to, to solve some pretty complex problems. Just for some terminology here, uh, the first layer is known as the input layer. The last layer is known as the output layer. And then any, any layer in between is known as a hidden layer. And so uh, if you have uh, just a single neuron that can do some uh, some classification, but when you start to add uh, multiple layers and especially hidden layer, uh, the ability of neural networks uh, uh, to, to uh, discriminate things goes uh, much higher. And so um, when we think of a deep neural network or deep learning, uh, that's where these deep feed forward networks come in. And we can see that this is just uh, a further, uh, uh, further extrapolation uh, of what we saw in the simple neural network. And that is that there are many, many, many more hidden layers between our inputs and outputs. And this essentially is just giving the neural network more processing power and more ability to differentiate between things. Um, it's important to note, uh, and this is something that is often brought up, that uh, these deep neural networks uh, require a significant amount of data in order to have good performance. And we can see here on the, the x-axis is uh, data volume, on, on the y-axis is our actual performance, and deep neural networks are continuing to go, <laughs> go up in their performance versus simple neural networks or traditional machine learning statistical models, especially when they have a large amount of data. Whereas simple neural networks uh, still perform well, they outperform traditional machine learning statistical models, so some of the things that I had showed uh, in the previous slide. But the interesting thing is, and, and also of note, is that if you have uh, maybe a limited amount of data, uh, limited volume of data, that your traditional machine learning statistical models will actually outperform those, uh, both the simple and the deep uh, neural networks. So there's definitely a trade-off, and this is something that uh, folks have to, to take into consideration when, when choosing uh, the particular uh, algorithm that they're, they're going to use in their machine learning, creating their machine learning model. And finally, uh, in the, the world of neural networks, I wanted to bring up uh, these convolutional neural networks. And these are uh, very important uh, in uh, image classification. And um, so this is, this is probably the most likely area that we'll see uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning come into play in pathology. And, and here is an example from that book uh, with a watermelon on the cover that I mentioned earlier, where they're talking about um, uh, handwritten character recognition. And, it, and it's the same with the digital pathology image, um, where you take uh, kind of an abstract idea uh, of uh, an image uh, and through a series of, of convolutions, which you can think of as like a transformation of these data and subsampling, you are able to extract uh, motifs 
And by what is meant by motifs is basically like, what are the important aspects of the, the input image? And you're able to extract those and then subsample down, extract, subsample down, and you get to uh, a, a smaller set of an abstract uh, representation of your initial image. And you're able to feed that into a, a deep feed forward network. And this is able to, to does really great job with classifying uh, the initial image. And you can kind of think of it as, you know, this is a very complex thing, hard to kind of describe in computer speak. And as we, we get the essence of it, we kind of, uh, um, you know, boil it down, reduce it. Um, we're able to feed that into a network uh, and it's able to, to handle that much more easily. And so as an example, uh, of a uh, convolutional neural network. Um, I um, was involved uh, in, a, in a project with Dr. Javach, and um, we used uh, the tool QPath, which is um, a uh, open source and freely available tool that I highly recommend uh, that um, is available for um, image analysis. And um, you're able to um, look at whole slide images and, and create um, uh, different areas of interest. Um, and what, what we were interested in in particular is um, to quantify the amount of fibrosis um, in folks with myeloprol myeloproliferative neoplasms. And so uh, we can see here uh, in uh, this table that there's a semi-quantitative way of grading uh, myelofibrosis, kind of, you know, going from zero to three. But but we sought to do it on a, you know, of the total amount of area uh, in which fibrosis can occur, how much uh, reticulant fibrosis is there actually? And so, in order to do this, uh, we scanned a, a number of uh, cases, 43, um, that uh, some of which, about half of which, had uh, uh, low. Uh, MF0 to MF1 uh, reticulant fibrosis, so that's that expert label, uh, versus um, another set had high reticulant fibrosis, so like MF2 to MF3. And what we had to do uh, was uh, quantify or kind of highlight the areas that actually had uh, um, uh, the ability to have fibrosis in them. And there's a nice tool that makes this relatively easy to do uh, within QPath. And um, we can see that there are, I've highlighted an area here in yellow, but there are a number of other areas. Um, and this, this really serves as the denominator. And the, the idea here was that we didn't wanna really include you know, the trabeculae here because um, of the, uh, the fibrosis really cannot be there. And so I was able to take um, those areas uh, of marrow space and use those as the denominator. So of, of all of the area that, um, fibrosis could be in, you know, how much is there actually? And so here's where uh, machine learning and this convolutional neural network came in. And um, by uh, telling uh, QPath um, that, you know, this, this here in blue is kind of representative uh, reticulin fiber, and this here in green uh, is a trabeculae, and really ended up being uh, not uh, reticulin fibrosis, so kind of a binary classifier. Um, I was able to say, uh, you know, take take these inputs on the image and uh, classify which pixels correspond to reticulin fibrosis and which pixels uh, are not. And the great thing about this was at the time, I didn't have a lot of, you know, knowledge of machine learning or artificial intelligence, uh, but QPath has uh, um, some baked in uh, tools and a very simple example to follow online. And so I was able to use an, an artificial neural network and um, I was able to kind of help select some of the features. Uh, and um, you can see that by varying these, you get better or uh, worse output. And you can actually do a live prediction, which we'll put uh, on this screen here or down here. Um, actually what it's classifying uh, as one of the classes that you've labeled versus another class. And so by doing this, um, we were able to take an image like this, and this is a uh, uh, bone marrow biopsy core without 
uh, increased fibrosis, so like MF0 to 1. Uh, and um, this is the, the output, the overlay of that algorithm. And you can see in blue, uh, it really does a good job of discriminating where these uh, reticulin fibers are. And the really nice thing is that it's able to output uh, a total area. And so we're able to take that total area of reticulin fibrosis and divide it by the total area uh, where reticulin fibrosis can occur and come up with a percentage uh, or proportion involved by reticulin fibrosis. And now we can see another example here of uh, bone marrow biopsy core with increased fibrosis, so MF3. And uh, again, the algorithm does a really nice job of picking up those reticulin fibers. And so this is an example of, uh, you know, something where I had limited knowledge, but there was a, a tool available to help me kind of apply some of these tools. And so then we took this, you know, low, uh, this group that had no increase in fibrosis or uh, MF0 to 1 and compared it to the group that had uh, uh, severe fibrosis, uh, MF2 to 3. And we were able to show uh, that there was a, a statistically significant difference in these two groups saying, you know, kind of as a proof of concept that yes, we can discriminate between these two groups. And so this was a really nice example of being able to use um, some basic knowledge of um, machine learning and just in an iterative fashion, go through and actually create a model. So now that I've gone through uh, a number of different algorithms and a, a couple of different examples of application uh, of machine learning algorithms to pathology, um, I just wanted to go over kind of the, the, the steps from A to Z uh, of, you know, let's say uh, you're going to actually want to, to see a machine learning algorithm from the, the start to the end. So as with all things uh, in modeling, uh, we start with data. But, uh, and this, this step here is not to be uh, taken lightly. This is probably one of the hardest steps uh, and it's termed data cleansing. Uh, and this is where we, um, you know, clean up all of the input data, normalize it, uh, and then where uh, the expert, uh, domain expert would come in and, you know, do the labeling, maybe, um, you know, say, okay, here are the mitoses or here's the reticulin fiber or, you know, these are uh, um, GCMS, uh, 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 GCMS output that, that, you know, are quality so we can release them. So whatever it is, this is where that would come in. The next step uh, is uh, known as data partitioning. And we take those prepared data and we split them into training data and test data. So about two thirds of the data we reserve for training and one third of the data we, we reserve for testing. And the reason that we do this uh, is um, this is a better way to discriminate how our model will actually work. The next step is uh, feature selection. And this is something that I didn't really touch on uh, a great deal before, um, but is very, very important. And you know, in the contrived example I used earlier of um, choosing a, a, a ripe watermelon, you know, just knowing three inputs, um, there's not, not a whole lot of attributes that you have to select, but you can think of um, some data sets where there are many, 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 many different attributes like tens or hundreds or thousands. And so it does become important to choose which uh, features are the most important um, to actually make your uh, predictions. And so this is sometimes can be done by experts saying, you know, this is an important feature or this is an important feature, but there are also tools available that help um, determine which features are most important. The next step in the overall process, now that we've got our data and we prepared it, uh, we split it into our sets and chosen our features, is to select an actual model or to set to select an actually an actual algorithm. A few examples I gave earlier, like uh, uh, support vector machines or k-means clustering or you know the convolutional neural network, and you're doing this again with some knowledge of you know how how best to discriminate between the different classes that you have. And what is depicted by this uh, five by five grid, it is, is what is known as uh, cross-validation. And so um, not only are we selecting our model and then training it, um, but excuse me, the training data are split into uh, five different groups. And um, the model is initially trained on four of the five. Uh, 
this is a leave one out uh, uh, method. And it, this is kind of, you can think of it like a, a pre-verification step uh, or a pre-test step. And uh, this is done in an iterative fashion so that each group is uh, the kind of pre-verification group. And this is done because if your model, uh, you know, maybe does really well uh, uh, against this group, but not so well against the others, you can already kind of start to see that it, it, it really won't do well against your test data and it won't do well in the real world. And so you can make uh, tuning uh, to some of the, the upstream parameters uh, to make the model fit better. And so um, when we're going through and, and training the model, uh, I wanted to bring up this kind of Goldilocks phenomenon as with all things, uh, uh, there is you know too little and too much and just enough. And so uh, the same applies uh, when we're uh, fitting a machine learning algorithm. And so on the y-axis here, we have the error rate. Uh, on the x-axis, we have what's known as an epoch and that's a, a full cycle through uh, all of the training data. Uh, and um, the the uh, solid line here is our test data, and the um, dashed line is our training data. And so we can see, you know, when we're first starting out training our model, and the goal here is to distinguish between uh, these uh, uh, black circles and white circles. We can see here that uh, this uh, plane that separates them is not doing a great job of discriminating on the training data set or the testing data set. You know. Uh, and so we continue in our in our journey, and we get to a place where it's you know really really well fit on our training data. Uh, we can see that you know obviously there are still some um, uh, black circles that are in this boundary, but it's mostly white circles. And the same thing is true for our testing data. And at this point, if we're uh, looking at the um, the error rate, uh, we can see that we've really minimized it both for the training data and for the testing data. And you can get to a, a point, and this, this often, ha often happens, and this is something that, that deep neural networks are kind of notorious for, uh, of, of overfitting your model. And so you see in the training data, it's doing a really good job of discriminating, and it has this kind of uh, blobby shape uh, where you know, only white circles are included and, and no black circles are included. But uh, because we've, we've really, really uh, made our model fit this data set, uh, it loses the ability to discriminate uh, between uh, black circles and white circles uh, once it goes to the testing data. And this is an example of an overfit model. And it's something that you kind of want to avoid when you're going through the tuning uh, of your model. And so you're, you're really looking for this optimal fit here. And so I bring in just briefly uh, one of the, the ideas in, you know, the goodness or the, the, uh, 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 ability of the, the machine learning model to actually discriminate between things. And that's uh, the receiver operating characteristic curve. And so on the y-axis, we have sensitivity or recall, uh, the true positive rate. And then on the y, uh, the x-axis, excuse me, we have the, the false positive rate. And so uh, what it's done here is that, you know, if we have a, a classification system like, you know, white or black uh, circle, um, and we vary the cutoff for where that is, it will take and, and graph each of these points. And this, this 45 degree uh, line is just random. So um, no, no uh, variability there. Whereas um, the line that can be uh, drawn here uh, is, or here, uh, these are the, the, the actual performance of the model. And so, um, when we get to, uh, there, are, there are two other indices, the UL index and the UDEN index. And the UDEN index is the difference or the distance between the, the leftmost and uppermost point in, in your receiving operating, receiving operator characteristic curve uh, and the 45 degree line and the UL index is uh, the, the difference uh, or distance between this uh, upper left most point of the, the graph and then the upper leftmost point of the receiving operating characteristic curve. And we, we like to think of um, the, the better discriminating models uh, will have really, really, really high uh, true positive rate or really, really high sensitivity. 
with a very, very low uh, false positive rate. So it, it would kind of follow my uh, uh, laser pointer here and uh, you know go up very, very fast. And, and as you vary the discrimination point, um, you know, obviously it will stay high. But um, this is something that uh, we can quantify with the area under the curve. And so if you can imagine, if you had a perfectly uh, discriminatory test, uh, it would be uh, an area of one. This goes to one, and this goes to one on the x and y axis. And so uh, as you get closer and closer to one, you, your model is said to be better and better at discriminating. And so this is something that um, we use as we're going through and uh, uh, training our model and tuning the model um, in order to say if the model, you know, kind of the goodness of the model, so to speak. There are many other different ways of, of testing the goodness of the model, but that's a commonly used one. And so finally, uh, after we've done our cross-validation, uh, we get to the, the actual verification step. And so now we have our, um, our uh, model uh, that is really, really well tuned, and we can put it through our training data kind of as a final step. And uh, finally, we get to, to use our test data, and we can do some of these performance benchmarking uh, tools, as I was talking about. And um, once you've done that, you are able to deploy this internally. And uh, this is an important distinction, and I'll, I'll make this again uh, as we go to the next slide that the deployment of the machine learning model is really important, uh, really, uh, I guess I would say, uh, constrained to uh, the, the training data that it represents. Uh, so let's say, you know, you're at a site at the University of Washington training data, um, you know, when you do your internal deployment, um, it, it, it really does do best there. And so now as we get to external site deployment, maybe, um, you know, a, there's a, a digital pathology uh, a company that has a, a, a classification algorithm and they want to give it to you. It's very important, kind of not dissimilar, or actually very similar to um, when we bring in new testing uh, in, in really any area where you have to do uh, local site verification. And sometimes you need to retrain the model uh, on uh, local uh, data. Um, and this is because there are um, biases that are introduced into the machine learning algorithm based on whatever uh, sites data that, that you're using. And so this is, this is really kind of uh, the last part of the talk uh, where we're you know, talking about some of the limitations of machine learning algorithms. I've shown a number of ways in which they're very, very powerful. Uh, but uh, it's important to know, you know what, they, what they can't do or what they have trouble doing, uh, or maybe some of their Achilles heels, if you will. And so the first of these is uh, this term generalizability. And I was kind of introducing this on the last slide where, you know, you take a model and uh, you train it on data from site A or site one here. Uh, and uh, it may, uh, it, it is much less likely to perform well at site two. And so you might say, well, let's just combine all of those data and train our model. And unfortunately, that doesn't really improve things. So what's shown here is uh, what we saw before, uh, this receiver operating receiver operator characteristic curve or ROC curve, where we have sensitivity or recall or the true positive rate on the y-axis and the x-axis is the false positive rate. And what's represented by this uh, solid line here is training a model on both uh, on data from both sites one and two. And so you can see that when the model is, um, when the model is, is, is uh, analyzed on those same data that it was trained on, it, it, it works very well. But if you take the model that was trained on data from sites one and two, and you try to use that on just site one model, so again, trained on, on data from both sites, but now we're just trying to use it at site one, you know, could be University of Minnesota and University of Washington, uh, site one and site two, it doesn't perform as well. And the same is, is true if you take that combined set of data for training and go to a second site. It also doesn't, uh, doesn't perform as well. And so this is that concept of, you know, there are really uh, kind of nuances to data at each particular site. And it's important to um, 
to retrain or to at least verify your model based on your own site's data. The second concept uh, that I want to get into is this, this idea of shift and drift. So over time, we can see here on the Y or on the X axis uh, is time. And on the, the Y axis is that area under the curve of the receiver operator characteristic curve. We can see that um, over time, there are discrete changes in the distribution of the input parameters. And so that's known as a covariate shift. That's where this idea of shift comes from. So uh, there are also drifts in the, the, the data. So there are gradual in accumulated changes in the input data. So over time, the input data has you know, different distribution. It also has different uh, kind of different nature, so to speak. And so what's shown here by the solid line is data trained, or excuse me, a model trained uh, on data from 2001 to 2002. And so in, in the year 2000, maybe this is 2001 or 2003, uh, it performs really well. So it has really good discrimination, but over time, as those data change, we can see that it, it loses, its, loses its ability to, to discriminate. Uh, and this is actually with uh, prediction of intensive care unit length stay in males. Uh, and uh, when we look at the, the data trained on, uh, or excuse me, the model trained on data from the entire time period, um, you know, it, it performs worse at the beginning, but it over time does better. Uh, and it's not great at, at, at any of these points in times, but what this is really trying to illustrate is that your data will change with time. The, the, both the, the distribution of the input data and the input data themselves will change. And so this really necessitates ongoing monitoring, kind of like we do for a lot of uh, our laboratory tests. Um, you can't just you know set it and forget it when you have a new model. It, it, it does require performance monitoring and likely recalibration. So these are you know some of the key uh, key limitations. Uh, and finally, um, there's this idea of model stability. And um, the idea here is that unstable or brittle models um, may uh, output really, really different results, even if the input data vary only slightly. So, to you and me, if there's a slight move of you know where a mitosis is in a particular field, we'll still count it as a mitosis. But for a machine learning algorithm, uh, image classification algorithm, it might have a lot harder time doing this. So to illustrate this point, um, there is uh, an example here where um, images of uh, benign and malignant skin lesions are class being classified. And so this is pretty easy for even me not being a, a dermatologist to say, you know, this is probably a benign skin lesion where this is malignant. And what, what you can do is you can add what's called adversarial noise to this image. And you get this output image that doesn't really look all that different. You know, this to me, to my eye, I would be like, okay, I'm glad you changed it, but this is clearly still benign and this is clearly still malignant. And the really striking thing is that with the machine learning algorithm predicting this image, it says, okay, that's almost certainly benign. It's 90% likelihood that it's benign and only a 10% likelihood that it's malignant. But when you take this modified image, and this is the striking thing, it classifies it as malignant. And you would say, oh my gosh, what, what is that? That's crazy. Like there's no way that's malignant. But to the machine learning algorithm, when it gets this adversarial noise, even though it doesn't look different to, to you and me, it, it, clearly fools the, the algorithm. That's the same thing when we look at this malignant lesion. It's you know saying, okay, no, no sweat. This original image is malignant. And once we add adversarial noise, it's saying, oh my gosh, this is definitely, this is fine. And so this is really um, illustrating that even though to, to your eye and my eye, subtle changes in the, the actual image might not mean much, but that it can can really spell disaster for your image classification models. And so it's really important to be, to be aware of unstable or brittle models. So I'm almost to the end of my time here. Uh, I'll summarize a few things and leave you with some final thoughts and then be happy to take questions. Um, but I really want uh, folks to be able to come away with the, the basic tenets underlying machine learning. I hope I was able to kind of demystify it. 
And we talked about, you know, what goes into an actual data set. And we talked about, and I'm a very visual learner, you know, how you actually go through and teach this machine learning algorithm. And I talked also about a number of different applications. I think it's important to know where this might fit within pathology. Um, so Dr. Klein's paper, where they were able to use uh, multiple variable regression uh, and predict the Oncotype DX score. Um, and then my example, and there are many, many, many more uh, image classification examples, and mine was actually a pixel classifier. Um, but uh, this, is, this is likely where we'll see uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, in pathology first as a widespread use. Finally, um, I wanted to outline the major benefits, which we kind of talked about in those applications, but also some of the important limitations of machine learning. So we talked about this idea of generalizability and shift and drift, and then this concept of adversarial noise. And so some final thoughts from the paper that I thought were, were uh, quite poignant. The best performance is really a blend of human machine and machine capabilities. So if you take a human alone or a machine learning algorithm alone, uh, neither performs as well as if you combine them together. And this has been a kind of a concern for a lot of folks um, that, you know, the machines will take over. But I think augmented intelligence is really the, the way of the future. Second, anatomic pathology will probably benefit or will almost certainly and already has benefited from these complex convolutional neural networks that I brought up. There is an analogous application of machine learning and uh, and complex laboratory tests. You know, we have to do local site verification. We have to do calibration over time. So this is something that is already kind of within the, the wheelhouse of pathologists. Um, but there's definitely additional work needed in, you know, what are the generalizability limitations? How do we do verification and monitoring of these machine learning models as we're trying to adapt them locally? Uh, and uh, so it's kind of a brave new world. Uh, I leave you with my references and uh, finally some acknowledgements. My wife, who has helped me immensely through my residency training and, and before that, uh, my folks and my sister, Dr. Stoffel, for all of the wonderful help you've provided, Dr. Javach, as we've gone through uh, that really nice MDS fibrosis example, all of the MDL faculty for taking me under their wing and, and helping me learn a lot about molecular pathology. Um, Dr. Dolan and Dr. Johnson and Maggie and Gabby for being wonderful, wonderful support, supportive uh, program directors and uh, uh, helping me get through um, all, all of the LMP faculty that I've worked with have been really, really marvelous. Uh, and finally, all of my co-residents. Um, I leave you with some nice pictures of my furry companions to make uh, playing games a bit more interesting um, and uh, would like to open it up for questions in the final few minutes I have. Uh, I, Chris, Leo Furch here. That was a great, great presentation in an incredibly important area. Um, so thank you for that. You did a good job. Um, so first of all, could you please share the algorithm uh, so we can pick out good watermelons and cantaloupes in the summer? <laughs> I, I, I suffer uh, in that category when I go to farmer's markets. Um, uh, but uh, seriously, um, I just want to make a comment more, uh, directed um, at uh, uh, some of our earlier career docs and obviously trainees, and that is, this is going to be an essential tool in in your work as you go. Um, as we advance things in spatial omics, you know, spatial genomics, transcript. What in the next decade, I predict there are going to be instrumentation that will allow you to interrogate tissue samples um, and define, um, you know, not only how a cell looks, but its uh, phenotype, if you will, and what proteins are involved. And all of this will be important in understanding immune responses, you know, what type of lymphocytes are around these uh, cells or macrophages, what are they doing? And then importantly, um, we'll know over time what therapies are gonna be uh, effective uh, in these um, um, various cases. That we see. So this will not be um, discernible or doable 
with the human <laughs> capabilities that we have today, just our own. So it will be essential to embrace and know about this technology. I'm, I'm sort of reminded about, you know, way back <laughs> 35, 40 years ago, I was at a, at a American Association of Cancer Research and a famous uh, Nobel laureate, Sidney Brenner, was given a keynote express. And it was actually a smaller meeting at the time, with just a few thousand people. Now it gets over 20. But he started his session by um, asking all, and these are scientists, uh, physician scientists or PhD scientists. He, he uh, started his seminar by asking the group of saying, how many of you are training your um, graduate students, not only in molecular biology, but in bioinformatics? And you know, a, a paucity of hands went up in the and he said, shame on you all, you know, and said, <laughs> you know, if, if your graduate students and postdocs are going to be competitive in the future, they have to know the capabilities of in, uh, informatics as, as well as they do molecular biology in order to be able to do their work and ask the questions they have. So I think you really Absolutely. helped us see the importance, um, I think many of us see it. We don't know it. I learned a lot from your talk, and uh, I want to thank you for this, but also, you know, predict the future. We'll be here sooner than you think. Excellent. Yeah, that was that was my hope, that I could kind of demystify it and, and make it a little bit, uh, a little bit more down to earth, a little bit <laughs> more tenable. So thank you very much, Dr. Furt. Yeah. Hey, Chris, uh, Tony, Colleen, that was a really great talk. Thank you very much. I know we're a minute over time, but a quick question. If the machines make a mistake and a patient is harmed, where is the liability? <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's that's a really, really good question. Um, and I, you know, I don't know the exact answer uh, to that, but I do think uh, this is Kind of hearkening back to uh, what I was uh, mentioning before that that will likely be a team with the machines, and so I I do think it is very 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 important to have an understanding of how they work. I I do think it would lie uh, with those folks interpreting the test, probably. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, <laughs> perhaps. Chris, I can oh. give. I I feel like oh, I, sure. that, that probably might fall under um there so. Recently, essentially, there's FDA regulation required of clinical decision support that's considered a medical device. And really, it has to be determined. The determination of whether it's a medical device has to do with um, determination of whether the decision support, in many cases, an algorithm, is, is essentially making the decision or just presenting you know, options. And that's ultimately the clinician making the decision. So. Um, there's a few papers that recently came out on this that Chris, I can share with you. Um, actually, oh, your, yeah. your new fellowship director is one of the authors and, and an expert in this area. <laughs> area. So, um, but I, I think that that's probably where um, this is going in terms of liability. Right. And one other quick one. There was a, a program that was developed several decades ago by I think IBM called Internist and was supposed to bring together physical findings and lab values and history and so forth and, and make a bunch of diagnoses and help clinicians in their work. And I, I, have, I haven't heard anything about it in a long time. And maybe I'm just not reading the right articles, but is that still? Would this have been quite a while ago, like several yeah. decades? Yes, yeah, okay. several decades ago. I think my, I think it's taught as one of the kind of the, the tenets of uh, informatics, um, but I, I'm not, I, I don't know if it's um, still in use. I haven't heard about it in a long time, but it it seemed like uh, you know the the bee's knees of the time. But um, yeah, okay. I I know Watson, uh, which was incredibly popular in the the lay press. Um, I I think they I want to say they used it at MD Anderson, uh, and it it didn't perform quite as well as they would have hoped. I think you know obviously very very important tools, and I think we'll probably see something like that in the future, but. Um, maybe a bit a bit biting off a bit more than it could chew at the time right okay thank you 
All right. Thank you, Chris, for a wonderful presentation. We will talk to everybody next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.